Once again, we welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices. We are happy to welcome back to the program Susanna Barnes. She is a Young Voices contributor. And Susanna, for those who are getting acquainted with you for the very first time, take just a moment to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me back. Uh, As you mentioned, my name is Susanna. I'm a Young Voices contributor, and I also do fiscal and labor policy at a think tank in the D.C. area. Okay, I'm looking at an article that you wrote for, I believe this was for the Detroit News, about uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer's efforts to expand pre-K programs throughout the state of of Michigan. And I'm I'm sure there's a very noble intention there because, hey, you know, this is getting kids, you know, prepared as early as possible and and, and starting on early education. But you point out that uh, there's, there's another problem that looms that simply bringing more kids into these programs isn't going to solve. What is that problem? You're absolutely right. Public preschool provides a great option for students to get into pre-K, but the problem with Michigan's plan right now is that there's a big teacher shortage for the already existing public pre-K system, and admittedly, the Michigan public pre-K is one of the best in the country. Uh, I'm very proud of my home state for how hard they work to provide low-income students with that quality level of education. But if you add more students to the program without addressing this teacher shortage, you're just going to see, or what we're expecting to see is based on other states that have implemented these programs is lower educational outcomes, more educational inequality, none of which we're looking for in a state that already has pervasive educational inequality. So what are some of the reasons behind that that teacher shortage? Some of the reasons behind the teacher shortage in the pre-K system are, frankly, they are on, they are paid a smaller amount than other schools, especially in Michigan, where, as I mentioned, there's a lot of inequality. If you're in, say, the Detroit area, it is a lot more appealing to go work for a preschool in one of the richer suburbs than in inner city Detroit. Now, we there's lots of ways we can address that, but that's one of the most pervasive reasons why there's a teacher shortage in these public systems. No, that would that would make sense. Now, what about some of these other states? I believe you mentioned New York State specifically as, as a place we could look to to say, okay, so how does that how does that work? What can we learn from from their experience? So when New York City expanded its public pre-K system, the richest boroughs got the seats. So instead of these going to low income communities, the example I use in the article is the Bronx, they went to very wealthy communities like Staten Island. Now, this was not the goal of the expansion. The hope was to get more low income students who would otherwise not have access to pre-K into these programs, but that wasn't what happened in reality. And it's really important to look at that difference between the intentions in reality. And while some of these disparities have been resolved in New York City, we still see de- developmental lags, especially for minority Black and Hispanic communities. So it, it solves some of the problem, but but it's not the broad solution that, that perhaps uh, its proponents were hoping it would be. Yes, exactly. So some students are seeing good educational outcomes but it's not providing that readiness for kindergarten that we'd be hoping for. And other states like Tennessee actually had programs so faulty that people said it would have been better if the children didn't go to preschool at all than go to these state-based programs. Now, that's a worst-case scenario, but it's definitely not working the way that people would hope public pre-K programs would. So what are the – I'm going to take it kind of back to, to some of the basics here. These pre-K – educational programs, what do they hope to accomplish that, uh, you know, that otherwise wouldn't happen if, if these kids were just playing and being kids and then waiting for, you know, their, their turn to start kindergarten? Pre-K has been shown to be really beneficial for setting students up for success, not just at kindergarten, but there's evidence that points to pre-K being a strong indicator of success at the post uh, high school level into graduate school. So, these public programs are hoping to provide low-income students with that opportunity to be set up better for their future educational efforts. Now, preschools do that in two ways. They, of course, have education, you know, learning your colors, learning your ABCs, but then also social education, so how to interact with your peers at your age and how to interact with adults as well. So the hope would be to provide students whose families maybe can't afford these private programs with the opportunity to achieve that same level of educational achievement and social achievement that you see from the higher income brackets. Interesting. 
I mean, I, I'm not trying to harken back to, you know, all the old days, you know, why we just, you know, we went out and we played and, and didn't worry about schools. Uh, but, but when you, when you talk about setting them up for success, um, is, is that in, in, uh, you know, literacy? Is it in uh, functional literacy with math and reading and that kind of thing? Or are, are there other uh, aspects of that success that have to be taken into consideration? How do they define success, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, so there's a lot of different categories of success. Those literacy rates and math achievement, it might look a little different for a three-year-old when you think about math, where maybe it's the ability to count up to five or say their age, but those sorts of things are really important for child development. But it's also other development milestones, even down to things like potty training, that can really show the difference in uh, educational output in the long in the long run for these students. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting is that preschool, of course, exposes children to more words, and the amount of words you're exposed to within the first five years of life dramatically affect your educational uh, achievement. So if you're read to a lot, even when you can't understand what's being said to you, you're much more likely to do well in school. And so preschool and the amount of time that these students are spending just interacting with books and blocks and other things to develop their mental skill and their motor skill are all signs of educational attainment. And is, as far as the the teacher shortage, is there a, a a simple way to solve that, or is that is that a pretty complicated problem in and of itself? The teacher shortage is definitely a complicated issue. There is a lot of pieces that are at play with the teacher shortage. One thing that could help at least to reduce the burden on teachers is providing other ways for parents to provide education that maybe they can't afford. I talk about in my article education savings accounts, which provide teachers or provide parents with a set amount of money that's to be allocated towards their children's educational needs. So maybe that would be for preschool or maybe it would be for some sort of therapy if their child has a learning disability, but these can be used in many different ways based on the needs of the individual child. So this would of course help with that teacher shortage because you have students maybe going to private school or doing an alternative school like Montessori while also providing those pathways to educational attainment that we care so much about. Interesting. I know school choice is a really hot button issue for, for many, many yes. states, but uh, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate for just one moment here. Just um, is, is this encouraging parents to put their children into, for instance, a pre-K um, education settings? Um, in other words, could, could this serve as a, as a very convenient and uh, beneficial babysitting service, you know, in, in some people's minds? Do you, do you ever hear people, uh, you know, wonder about that possibility? People definitely wonder about the misuse of parents using these funds for, there's been cases where they've used it for ski lessons or for dance class. And that is a potential outcome. The question then becomes, is that a bad thing? In my view, parents are doing what they believe is best for their children. If maybe their children is just very bright and needs to, doesn't need that additional help with reading, but maybe is not developing uh, their fine motor skills, maybe taking an art class is better for them than a preschool. It, that is completely up to the teachers and or the parents and depends on the individual needs of the children. I have to say, I like the idea that it doesn't have to be one size fits all, because I think uh, kids learn, you know, in different ways. Some kids are visual learners, some kids are kin- uh, kinesthetic learners, you know. Um, so it's it's nice to have that choice. How does how does uh, Governor Whitmer r- react to this? I've I've been under the impression she she leans pretty solidly to to the left. Is is she in favor? Of, uh, of bringing more teachers on board, or is, is that a secondary consideration to simply expanding the program and bringing more kids on board first? She hasn't responded from what I can see to the concerns of even teachers who are in this Great Start Readiness program, which is the Michigan Public Pre-K. I haven't seen her responding to their concerns about adding more students without addressing the teacher shortage. I think uh, expanding public pre-K is a bit more of a politically popular opinion. And so I would love to see her talk about ways to address the teacher shortage, but expanding the Great Start Readiness program has been 
one of her primary issues since she first campaigned. So I think that will be her focus. And I, I don't know the lay of the land. Um, is, is the Michigan legislative branch, is it, is it dominated more by Democrats or Republicans? Does that affect uh, the, the way that uh, these policies are addressed as well? A lot of these are just straight from the executive branch. So they're earmarked in her budget. So Michigan is a purple state. It kind of goes back and forth. I believe right now it's dominated by Democrats, but these sorts of things are just earmarked in the governor's budget. So she's the one making those final decisions. All right. Very enlightening. Susanna Barnes is our guest in this segment. And uh, Susanna, thank you so much for taking the time to, to research and write about this. For people who wish to follow you on social media, where can they find you? Yeah, so I am most active on Twitter. You can follow me there at Susanna E. Barnes. Very good. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Hey, we're happy to welcome Francis Floresca back to the program. Francis, uh, it's good to catch up with you once again. For people meeting you for the first time, take a moment. Tell us about yourself. Well, my name is Francis Floresca, and I live in Georgia, where we just finally passed a school choice bill. It took such a long time. Okay, three years is quite a while for finally passing an ESA bill. And I have been excited to promote school choice pretty much wherever I am. And this is such a huge opportunity for Georgia. And I look forward to being involved with families to make sure that every child gets the best education that works for them. So, yeah, you mentioned in your article, and this is an article on chalkboardnews.com, that uh, this was not a slam dunk by any means. It, it took a lot of work over the course of years. Mm-hmm. Walk us through that process. When when were these, uh, I guess they're ESAs, this is called the Promise Scholarship Act. When was it first introduced and, and what was the, give us kind of a rough outline of the path that had to be followed before it finally was passed. Mm-hmm. So this bill first was introduced in 2022 and Basically, it didn't really get heard at all during that legislative legislative cycle. It was briefly brought up in 2019, but that was before the whole school choice wave we have now. So that doesn't really count. But then in 2023, people were hoping it would finally pass. But there were several Republican lawmakers from primarily rural areas who opposed it because they thought this won't actually help students in our area. The reality is is that in the entire country, there are seven in 10 families in rural communities who actually are within 10 miles from their closest private elementary school. And in Georgia, there has been a rising movement of micro schools and learning pods, especially after a governor Kemp signed a bill to give more options and allow those to thrive in the state back in, I believe, 2021. So that um, has been such a big option in um, in those rural communities. And homeschool, of course, is always a big thing in Georgia. And that really was a huge opportunity for to have these, this ESA pa- finally passed. You mentioned that uh, the, the ones who voted against it in the House uh, included six Republicans from primarily rural areas. And I think one of the objections that I hear uh, in Idaho, where we're also fighting a school choice battle, is, <laughs> well, it's not going to serve the, the students in those rural areas. I'm sure that was an argument that came up in Georgia. How did that pan out? Well, eventually we did get a handful of elected officials, as you mentioned, to finally vote for the bill. I think there were just a lot of negotiations that finally came about to make sure that the bill passed and there were um, there was ex- expanded um, um, expanded how, how, how much the students would actually get in these ESAs as well as kind of making sure that the students for the lowest performing schools would get the funding first. So there was a bit of a the bill did get watered down a little bit before it finally passed. And even a Democrat voted for the bill. Last year, we did have a Democrat who also voted for the bill, but she has since become a Republican. Her name's Representative Misha Maynard, and the Democrat who voted for it this year is Representative Stinson. And it's really interesting to see um, Democrats cross um, 
cross over party lines to ensure that um, this bill get this bill got passed. And that was an amazing thing. And hopefully she doesn't get knocked down by her party for voting for the bill. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so interesting in my home state of Idaho. Um, th- I think this was the third year that I'm aware of that uh, educational choice was, was coming back and it was Republicans actually a Republican chairman or two committee chairman who killed it in committee. It never even got a hearing. It was like, wow. But it's the Republicans that, that seem to be um, circling the wagons. And I, I've heard that that's at the behest of, you know, the, the teachers unions. Did teachers unions play any any kind of a role in either opposing or finally helping get this passed in Georgia? I mean, teachers, uh, teachers unions will always oppose school choice no matter what. In Georgia, teachers unions don't seem to be that strong. They still have a strong hold on the Democratic lawmakers, but they don't have as much of a stronghold as they do in other states. As you mentioned, Idaho is having a hard time, especially you mentioned um, the unions and it being a, a very rural, a rural state. But I'd like to point out that West Virginia is a very rural state. And ever since they passed school choice, which school choice was hardly ever really a thing in Georgia in in West Virginia before it passed. And now there's so many expanded opportunities in the state ever since they passed ESAs in 2021. So let's talk about what some of those expanded opportunities look like. You specifically mentioned micro schools in your article. For for people who aren't familiar with that term, what exactly are micro schools? Micro schools, it's hard to explain, but you could always see it as a hybrid between a homeschool and a private school. And a lot of these micro schools tend to be tailored to the students' needs. The class sizes are so much smaller and there's so much more exploration and personalized learning that can be done in these micro schools. And in fact, I visited several micro schools in the state. Um, I visited an Acton Academy, a Chi Pod Academy, and I also visited a micro school intended for special needs students here in the Augusta area known as SOAR Academy. Every single one is different and every single one tailors individualized learning to all these different kids because every single child is different and they all don't learn differently. And so that learning option has been such a wonderful opportunity for these families to find an education that works for their child. I know in in Idaho, the the chief complaint that I hear against school choice is, well, it's taking deadly aim at our public schools. This is all about driving a (laughs) stake through the heart of our public schools. I assume that that's that's probably something that's heard in these other states where school choice has been, you know, up for debate. You hear the argument over and over again. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if it's Georgia. It doesn't matter if it's Utah. It doesn't matter if it's West Virginia or Arizona. You will always hear that argument. It's going to hurt public schools. The reality is that it will actually help public schools because there is so much competition that forces these public schools to actually improve their standards. I saw it firsthand when I lived in Utah, and I hope to see it again here in Georgia. I mean, Utah has improved in education standing for quite some time now because of those school choice options, even without um, ESAs. And now ESAs will just improve Utah even more. And Georgia, we're in the middle when it comes to education around 26, 27. And Basically, I'd love to see those opportunities arise here for families so we can improve education for public schools as well. I know competition is sometimes a dirty word in, in you know, some mm-hmm. people's vernacular, but it seems like that's what really sharpens everybody's game. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, when you have to compete, when you have to earn, you know, the, the patronage of, you know, either parents or, or their students, it, it seems like that's when, when everybody puts forth their best effort. Exactly. And I just hope that every child finds that opportunity that works for them. I even say there are good public schools out there and every child should be able to find that school for them. So where, where does Georgia go from here is, is, uh, I mean, the, the program, it's passed the legislature now. Um, mm-hmm. are, are they still going to have to kind of watch their backs? Will there be attempts to try to rein it back in or perhaps mm-hmm. even, you know, uh, take it away in, in subsequent mm-hmm. legislative sessions? 
Well, unfortunately, and fortunately, while this bill passed, it is only for the lowest performing schools, the low bottom 25% of schools in the state. So we still need to work on expanding it. Governor Kemp will sign it. He said he will sign it because he said it has, we have run out of next year's to finally pass the school choice bill. And, you know, finally we passed it, but there's just still so much more to do. And I just say with school choice, the battle is never ending because you will still have to deal with people who want to get rid of it in future years. So we'll keep watching that battle. I'll make sure, watch my watch everyone's <laughs> backs to make sure that this stays intact and we can hopefully expand it in the future. It sounds like they'll, at least they'll have a track record or something they can look at to say, well, look, here's, here's mm -hmm. what we've seen happen in the state. Um, we are up against the clock here. Uh, we're talking with Francis Floresca. Where can people follow you on social media? Where can they follow mm -hmm. your work? Yeah, so my Twitter is Francis and Flo, F R A N C E S A N N E F L O, and my Instagram, that's also the same as well. My, my website is francisfloresca.com, F R A N C E S F L O R E S C A.com. And feel free to follow me there, and I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, I look forward to our next conversation as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again. Welcome back. This is our third segment of Moving Forward with Young Voices Today. We're happy to welcome back to the program, Zaina Resley. Zaina, good to see you once again. For people meeting you for the first time, take just a moment and tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Hi, Brian. It's great to be back. My name is Zaina Resley, and I work in state government affairs at a D.C. think tank. So essentially, I get to travel across the country working at expanding liberty at the local level. And I'm also a contributor with Young Voices, where I focus on issues related to urbanism, economics, and immigration in the Southwest. Well, I'm looking at a marvelous article that you wrote, or an opinion piece you wrote for the Albuquerque Journal about uh, legislative efforts to jack alcohol taxes or merely virtue signaling money grabs. And I, I, almost, I almost have to stop and applaud you because I think that says it so well. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about... Uh, what what is going on in, in New Mexico where where they want to raise the excise taxes on alcohol? So New Mexico's legislative session ended not too long ago. In this past session, there were three major proposed alcohol tax hike bills that were all struck down, which is a good thing. But this has been an ongoing battle in New Mexico. New Mexico right now is the state with the highest rate of alcohol-related deaths per capita. So this is definitely a pressing issue in local communities as well as the legislature. But these bills that keep getting proposed year after year do not effectively decrease the rate of people drinking and are just not a great long-term or short-term solution to the ongoing problem. So is that the stated purpose? I mean, the legislators who are pushing these bills are there. This is to, you know, encourage people not to, to drink as much because they have to pay more. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look for whatever noble intention they're, they're putting behind these proposals. Yes. So there's kind of two main meanings behind them. The first one that is the common conception is yes. If we tax liquor at a higher rate, we will decrease consumption which statistics show just is not the case. And these taxes are often regressive, so they hit the people that are the hardest off, they just hit them harder. So it already, it just, they don't target the correct demographic. The second reason is legislators are stating that they think that these tax hikes will um, result in giving more money to programs to help reduce alcohol consumption. But right now they already have pretty high taxes. It's already generating 50 million for the state per year. And that 50 million has not been effectively addressing the issue. So I doubt putting more money to it will do the same thing. <laughs> so none of this is denying that uh, there, there are problematic things with the consumption of alcohol. I think you know, any, any reasonable person can say, okay, there's a price that comes with, uh, with you know, the consumption of alcohol. But I love that you've zeroed in on behind all those, uh, you know, those noble intentions. It seems like somebody's pretty hungry for, for another uh, fistful of money. A hundred percent. These taxes result in the state making a lot of money. Even the current tax now, half of that just goes directly back to the state. And New Mexico's in a unique position because economically they're doing fantastically right now. 
They are the second highest oil producing state in the country right behind Texas, and they're headed towards a $3.5 billion general fund surplus, which is where the money from the alcohol taxes is also going. 50% of that is also being added to the general fund surplus. So I think a main reason why these taxes are so popular is, yes, they make the state a lot of money. And let's, I know you give some examples in your article, but let's, let's spell out a couple examples of what some of these bills would have done in terms of raising that excise tax on alcohol. What would that have looked like had these passed or had, had some of them passed? Yes. So the first one that got a lot of local media attention was HB 179. This one was targeted at the consumer. It would have added an additional 25 cent tax to a glass of wine, bottle of beer, or a shot of liquor. This would slam the tax rate up anywhere from 375% to 650% on beer, wine, and spirits. So that one is crazy. And then the next two, this one, I find these two especially interesting on how they would end up controlling consumption. These ones proposed 212 and 213, a restructuring of the state's alcohol tax system, which would have shifted the tax from being applied at the wholesale to the retail level. So if these would have been passed, it would have just resulted in honestly hurting local businesses more and bar owners. But under 212 bar at bars, liquor would have been taxed at twice the rate of beer. And under 213, it would have resulted in a higher tax on more expensive drinks and a lower tax on bottom of the barrel liquor. Interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a drinker, so I, I can't tell you, you know, I don't, I don't know what, uh, what the going price is, you know, for, for a shot of something good or a glass of wine, but um, still, that doesn't seem very fair to the, to the people who do, you know, in, enjoy imbibing. Definitely. And it's just also really hard to understand what the external cost of alcohol is on society because there's two types of drinkers. There's obviously the heavy drinkers, which they're trying to target, and then moderate drinkers. And these taxes really hurt the moderate drinkers who are just trying to go out and enjoy being social. Although there's a goal to try and decrease consumption in a certain group, all the taxpayers of New Mexico end up bearing the burden of these. So I, I'm curious, what was it in the end that, uh, that defeated these bills? So for the first one I talked about, they even had a legislative impact report. They had a bunch of legislators working on finding the impact of what these, um, what the outcomes would have been. And they found for the taxes being all the way up to 650% higher, it maybe could have reduced consumption by 5%. So that just does not seem like a very effective outcome. And they also stated that these kinds of bills lack mechanisms that ensure that these new resources are actually being invested in evidence-based programs that would actually help reduce consumption. So on the first bill, they were saying there's really no way to prove that this would do what it's intended to do. And the other two, those ones I don't even think made it as far in the first place, but that would have just really hit the local businesses. And again, during a time when the state is thriving economically, it just does not seem fair to be coming for local businesses. Now, lest somebody misunderstand and think that uh, that I'm about to advocate for, no, we should all be consuming as much alcohol as possible. I do believe that decreasing consumption probably would bring a net good. What are some of the other ways that uh, that alcohol consumption could be addressed without getting the state involved and especially without unleashing, you know, the, the hounds of taxation. Definitely. I think when it comes to issues like this, that local institutions such as community groups, nonprofits, churches, and treatment centers are best at addressing these issues. Right now, the tax, um, most of it is going towards a DWI grant council. I was just reading an article saying, that they even find that these grant councils are really out of touch with the locality of these issues. And it's such a local issue. Each community is struggling with this differently. The best thing to do is to hand the reins over to civil society institutions because they know their communities needs the best. And if anything, I think it's a sign for people within their communities to step up and help. But I think as we've seen throughout history, when it comes to sin taxes and managing consumption, that government intervention just is not the best course to take. I mean, on the one hand, I do kind of favor excise taxes from the standpoint of um, they're a consumption tax. And if you don't want to pay the tax, you just don't consume whatever's being taxed. On the other hand, as you point out in your article, this isn't uh, this isn't having the effect that it's saying it's going to have. And I think you also point out in your article, there's no guarantee that whatever revenue was raised from those higher taxes is actually going to go to, to what its intended purpose is. Exactly. And I think if the legislature really has to intervene, they can collaborate with these community groups and these nonprofits, maybe put together a sort of working group to talk about ways that they can work together. 
I'm definitely more on the side of no government intervention, but of course that's hard to do because, you know, legislators are feeling such pressure from their communities saying you need to help with this. But I think it's going to take a lot of working with those local institutions, which it seems like that piece is missing a bit now. It seems to like we, we sometimes as voters don't make the connection that every time we invite a new government program or some new aspect of government involvement, um, there are unintended consequences that follow. It's got to be funded. Usually once it's there, it's, it's going to grow. And, and sometimes it grows in directions and ways that we didn't anticipate, you know, at, at the implementation of that particular policy. Definitely. It can be really hard to ensure that money going in different places is going to have the result that it's intended to. And also to say, I'm not completely against all excise taxes. New Mexico already has them in place. And I was just looking at a stat today. Um, They even have a higher wine tax, much higher than New York. So it's not to say that no taxes are there, but I think just adding more and more taxes on, especially is something that I hope going into the next session, New Mexico's legislatures really look at and say, you know, We already have the taxes there. What are some other creative things we can try? Because this clearly has not been working for us. One final question for you, Zaina, and that is um, you mentioned that uh, alcohol-related deaths are very, very high in New Mexico. Is there an explanation for for why that state in particular, you know, sees such a a high percentage of alcohol-related deaths? I was looking at some of the counties with the highest deaths and poverty is a big factor in it, which is also why, I mean, these taxes really don't sway consumption from buying bottom of the barrel alcohol. It's the nicer alcohol that's really more expensive under these taxes. So I think also finding and helping community programs that help with alleviating poverty and just getting involved at the local level, a lot of it does have to do with, yes, the people that are suffering the most from poverty. Very interesting. I really appreciate your insights on this, and I hope that uh, I hope that your words don't fall on deaf ears. You know, for those uh, readers in in uh, New Mexico, particularly those involved in the legislature. Again, we're talking with Zena Resley, a Young Voices contributor. And Zena, where can people find your work? Where can they follow you on social media? They can find me at Twitter at Zena Resley, and also my LinkedIn is Zena Resley as well. All right. Thank you so much. Good to visit with you Thank once you, again. Brian. All right. I look forward it's to our next conversation. We'll see you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. And we are back. This is Moving Forward with Young Voices. It's our fourth and final segment today. We're happy to welcome Alex Little back to the program. Alex, it's been a little bit since we visited, but could you take just a moment to introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name's Alex. Um, I'm currently an intern at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. So I focus on grand strategy, which is fairly broad, but essentially um, focusing on uh, what the U.S. um, national interest should be in terms of foreign policy. Boy, that's a that's a pretty hefty topic, too. So I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation, actually. I'm looking at your article that was in nationalinterest.org. Washington must push European strategic autonomy forward. And even as I read that headline, it, it occurs to me, Europe has leaned pretty hard on the U.S. for, for its security um, over the, the last couple of generations, at least. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what's going on and why the U.S. should work work towards helping Europe find more of its own autonomy or provide for its own security, rather? Sure. So I think with um, sort of the new class of congressmen coming in to Congress, there's been some momentum in terms of um, the U.S. shifting burdens over to Europe. So I start my piece highlighting um, Senator J.D. Vance's um, attendance at the Munich Security Conference, and he sort of represents, as I mentioned, this contingent of primarily Republican congressmen, including Josh Hawley, who wish to see Europe do more to provide for its own defense. And I think he really made a great point in highlighting Europe's rhetoric in terms of um, concerning the Russia threat while not necessarily putting their money where their mouth is and preparing for such a threat. And so promoting and encouraging European strategic autonomy is essential for a more um, restrained and disciplined foreign policy on on the U.S.'s part. And this latency is really nothing new. Um, In 2022, the U.S. uh, accounted for 
um, 50 of the world's 195 countries as um, formal treaty allies. Um, and U.S. allies do not carry a proportionate share of the burden of their defense, as Washington's allies account for roughly 36 percent of world economic output, but only 24 percent of world mil military spending. So I point out in the piece that um, this sort of phenomenon of Europe's apprehension is not necessarily Europe's fault. And many U.S. scholars and policymakers have really perpetuated this sense of um, European dependence on U.S. global leadership or primacy. Um, so th it's definitely something that's been a while. So when, when we're talking about uh, these European countries not holding up their end as far as the, the defensive spending, um, what kind of percentages are, are we talking about as, as far as, uh, I, I think it's measured in GDP, right? Uh, the percentage of GDP? That's correct. So um, there's been this expectation that um, NATO countries will spend approximately 2% of their GDP um, on defense. And historically speaking, a lot of Europe's uh, major powers have fallen short of this commitment. So uh, in terms of countries actually meeting this commitment, it's mostly been the, the Baltic countries and Poland have sort of been the superstars on that front. But um, these more affluent um countries that have sort of talked a good game have not really stepped up to the plate there. And as I mentioned in my piece, you know, Emmanuel Macron, who's sort of been this advocate for um, European strategic autonomy, he's talked a good game and even flirted recently with the idea of um, sending French troops into Ukraine. Um, but um, the but with um, sort of American war funding struggling and um, Germany refusing to send uh, Taurus missiles. I think that this move by Macron is more so trying to apply psychological pressure to allies to send Ukraine more money and weapons, assuming that they might find um, the notion of France sending uh, troops as sort of a scary option rather than um, providing um, military support themselves. I know there were a few people couldn't help but to make a comparison. Didn't Napoleon try that once upon a time? But it's it's apples and oranges. As far as the rest of Europe, though, um, that surprises me, though, to, to hear that Germany is is kind of holding back. Is Do do they do this out of a perceived sense of strate their strategic interest, or is there something else behind their decision um, not to, to lean into it harder? Sure. So Germany is sort of a tricky case because they've really um, relied on Russian energy for the longest time. So the energy part of the equation definitely um, factor just factors into their calculus in terms of their um, attitudes towards Russia. But um, th the United States has actually stepped up very heavily in that area in terms of providing Europe um, natural gas in the, its liquefied form, which is a much more expensive option compared to uh, natural gas provided through pipelines. So Germany is in a bit of a precarious situation in terms of um, supporting um, this sort of um, military um, front against Russia. But I think Germany is realizing that um, with, as I mentioned, the aid being held up in the United States, that Europe may eventually have to step up to the plate. What can Washington do to incentivize those European countries to, to take a larger role in providing for their own security? Sure. So um, my ideas to change the situation have been greatly influenced by analysts that I follow closely. Um, and Justin Logan of the Cato Institute actually wrote a very excellent article or paper, policy paper, rather, um, addressing this issue last year. And I think that his suggestions in the paper are very actionable. So um, he mentions that Washington needs to be more assertive in supplement and expressing that supplementing uh, Europe's defense forever is not in um, the United States national interests. And it's not practical. Um, also, reevaluating um, overseas deployments is another area that needs attention. So does the United States need 100,000 troops in Europe? I would argue not. And lastly, um, being more ambiguous about what the United States is willing to do militarily could provide a bit of a shock treatment for Europe to do more for itself. And I think these prescriptions are not something that would happen overnight, but this process needs to get started sooner rather than later. I, I noticed you had mentioned that in your article. This, this is not like a flip of the light switch, you know, and we'll just make the change and everything will be great. How long of a timetable would we realistically be looking at uh, should Europe decide to step up and, and assume that responsibility? Um, I think that question's heavily in the air. I mean, it, there's definitely a lot of factors that go into 
sort of that timetable, I would imagine it would take at least 10 or so years to sort of get this process um, sort of meeting its actual um, goals. Um, so it's definitely not something that um, will happen in the next administration or, or even the administration after that. It'll be a very um, long process. And and to that end, I know the uh, I don't know who to trust when it comes to information about the uh, Russia Ukraine war. At this point, it seems like there's there's a lot of spin going on on all sides. But I would love to get your prognostication as. Um, is 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 that moving to, is that conflict moving towards a resolve or is it moving towards intensifying and perhaps pulling more people in um that's a good question it seems that um as time has gone on russia has gained an advantage throughout in, in ukraine and so it becomes much more difficult for ukraine to sort of come to an agreement given that russia perceives that it's winning so it's I think that Ukraine was in a much better position to negotiate um, earlier on um, after it was having some successes in uh, late 2022. However, after this failed counteroffensive, Russia seems to be in the driver's seat. So it does seem difficult um, to come to an agreement. But I think that there are areas that Russia would like to uh, potentially have um, negotiations over, potentially having a demilitarized zone between um, Russian territory and Ukrainian territory, maybe potentially propped up by a non-NATO peacekeeping force, um, is something that I think could be um, negotiated. That's that's refreshing to hear some solutions, you know, put forth. And I, I appreciate your prognosticating for me. I know that's that's not an easy question to to answer. Um, here's here's one more kind of loaded question. Would it help if the U.S. were not quite so involved, not just in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but generally in, in the domestic affairs of, of these European countries? It seems like we're, we're pretty entangled in, in some ways. I would definitely say so. I think these countries are very affluent and perfectly capable of providing for their own defense. But this stagnation has definitely been perpetuated by uh, this US dependence on American power. And I think that the United States has much more pertinent um, security issues in other areas of the world, particularly in the Indo-Pacific with um, Taiwan. I think that that is a, an issue that is much more pertinent to U.S. Um, prosperity and is uh, is an area that the United States has been neglecting in lieu of um, providing support for Ukraine, given that there is sort of an overlap of weapons provided to Ukraine and weapons that Taiwan would need to um, stave off a Chinese invasion. Wow. It's interesting that you would mention that because we don't hear a whole lot about Taiwan and China, you know, by contrast, it's, it seems like most of the attention has been focused strictly on Ukraine and in Europe. Uh, again, we're talking with Alex Little. Alex is a Young Voices contributor. And Alex, I'd like to ask you, where can people follow you on social media? Where can they find your work? Sure. So I don't, I don't have a Twitter account, so please feel free to um, check me out on LinkedIn. I post my articles there. So um, you can find my work there. Okay. Hey, I I look forward to our next conversation just because I know that to what we've been discussing here is still kind of a fluid situation and I'm hoping for the best, but I, I feel like you've got a pretty well-informed viewpoint and I do appreciate you shining light on this subject. Thank you. And thank you for having me, Brian. All right. I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks, Alex. Me too. Bye-bye.